Good afternoon and uh, very good to be chatting to you about the Mount Battens. My name is Andrew Loney. I was at Magdalen and uh, began researching this book as an archives by fellow at Churchill College, Cambridge. Uh, and uh, what I'm going to do over the next 40 minutes is give you a, a quick presentation of the lives of Dickie and Edwina Mountbatten, uh, and then very happy to answer questions afterwards for about 20 minutes. The uh, Mountbattens are a fascinating couple. It's the story of both a, a very public marriage and also a rather complex private one. It's one in which there was an open marriage. Uh, they both took lovers. Uh, and uh, it's a story of two remarkable people and their achievements. And what I thought I'd do is, is start with their marriage, which was in uh, the summer of 1921 uh, at St. Margaret's in Westminster. Uh, and I'm just trying to bring up the slide now um, so you can see it. The book came out a year ago for the anniversary of his birth, oh, sorry, of uh, his assassination. And I'm hoping we can bring up, there we are. There they're getting married in July, 1922. It's one of the married weddings of the year. Uh, the best man was the future Edward VIII. Uh, the king and queen were among those who attended. Uh, and there were something like 8,000 people in the crowd. Uh, there's actually a very good Pathé film, uh, which you can see on YouTube, showing the numbers there. It was, the, it was bringing together a, a minor skin of royalty and probably the most wealthy heiress of her time, uh, Edwina, Curry, uh, Edwina sorry, um, Mountbatten. Now, the story begins uh, with the parents of Mountbatten, Prince Louis of Battenberg, who was eventually first sea lord, uh, and his wife, Victoria, who was a granddaughter of Queen Victoria. And Dickie was himself the last godchild of Victoria uh, and uh, had a relationship with, in effect, a century, almost a century of uh, the royal family. Edwina's grandfather was a man called Ernest Castle. He was extremely wealthy. He was the banker to Edward VII. And in fact, she was named after Edward VII and was his godchild. But she had a rather sad and lonely childhood. Her mother died when she was very young and she was sent away to school quite early or brought up by governesses. Dickie, on the other hand, had a happy family life. Uh, he had two much older sisters, uh, and uh, one who married the King of Sweden, one Alice who married uh, a Greek prince and was the mother of Prince Philip, and then a brother called George, who was a few years older, uh, and he went into the Navy. And he was destined to follow into his father's footsteps and go into the Navy too. Here he is at their home in Eaton Square. Uh, and that uh, gives you some idea of the, uh, how pretty that Edwina was as a child. It's a picture taken when she was nine. Uh, Dickie had a pretty conventional naval career. He went through Osborne and Dartmouth. In fact, he had been the same prep school as Guy Burgess, the subject of my last book. Uh, and uh, at Cambridge, where he did a couple of terms at Christ at the, after the First World War, he became very friendly with George and uh, Henry, the two sons of uh, George V, and through them became very friendly with uh, Edward, the Prince of Wales. And at his suggestion, uh, Dickie was uh, sent out to act as his aide-de-camp on uh, the, the several of his world tours. Uh, and they became very close, uh, the two of them. Uh, and Dickie was to, uh, um, in fact, offer to be best man to the future Duke of Windsor when he got married in 1937. Uh, the first girlfriend that, that Dickie had, and this is a book about their loves uh, as well as their lives, was a woman called Audrey James, who was a great socialite of the time. Uh, and he proposed marriage to her and also to this woman called Peggy Payton, who was the daughter of an Indian uh, colonel. But it was in the summer of 1921 that at Cowes he met Edwina Mountbatten. Both of them fell instantly in love. She was attracted by his um, slightly unusual behavior. He was very different from the conventional sort of guards officers that she'd previously known. Uh, and of course, he was drawn to this very beautiful and very rich woman. Uh, and she followed him out to India, where he was on one of his world tours between, uh, in the autumn of 1921. And in February 1922, they got engaged at the Viceroy's house. There were some concerns that he was a bit of a gold digger uh, and that she was rather young to marry. Of course, she came into her fortune when she got married. Uh, and uh, indeed, the Viceroy's wife wrote to Edwina's father saying, 
you know, what a shame she's not marrying someone with better prospects. But here he is climbing the mast on a, a, a yacht that they were on in that summer of 1921. Well, they came back, were married in July 1922, and they had a slightly unusual honeymoon and they went visiting their relations. Here they are with her present to him, uh, a Rolls Royce, which was uh, uh, she bought from the Prince of Wales. You can see the chauffeur at the back. Poor man actually sat in the back most of the journey as Dickie liked driving. Uh, it really began to expose the tensions in the marriage uh, because he was a, a, a needed to organize everything, micromanager. She was much more spontaneous, free-spirited uh, character. And so the arguments really began on the honeymoon. The second part of the honeymoon, they went to the States. They crossed it from the East Coast across the West. Here they are meeting Babe Ruth, the baseball player. They saw Jerome Kern uh, and eventually uh, traveling by train uh, went to stay with Mary Pickford and Douglas Fairbanks in Hollywood. There they made a, a film with Charlie Chaplin called Nice and Friendly. Uh, Edwina, who was always a very flirtatious figure, actually made a proposition to Charlie Chaplin. It's perhaps why he's smiling at this point. Uh, and um, uh, that didn't go out terribly well with poor old Dickie. Here they are in the film. And you can see a picture here of them returning. Dickie looking slightly despondent. He returned to uh, his naval duties. He was down in Portsmouth and they took the lease of a house called Adsdean near Chichester, where she acted as a hostess um, and he worked very hard on his studies. He had specialized in signaling, one of the few uh, officers at that time uh, who decided, to, who rose to the top, who decided to go down one of these specialist branches. Uh, and they would entertain every weekend among the people there as Douglas Fairbanks and Mary Pickford. Uh, and they had an extraordinary social life, mixing royalty, showbiz, people from Hollywood uh, and um, their own friends. Um, not a very intellectual group, but often a lot of very senior naval officers, which of course helped Dickie's career. Uh, it was at his time in India that he really took up his interest in polo. And here he is receiving a, a cup from uh, Queen Mary uh, with Bertie standing beside her. Now, poor old Edwina uh, was a highly intelligent woman, really looking for something to do. And all she really was allowed to do was shop and to take care of the house and see her friends and socialize. And so this picture is quite an important moment in the development of Edwina as a public figure. Here she is at the switchboard at the Daily Express with her great friend, Jean Norton, uh, during the general strike. Uh, and she also worked in Hyde Park. And what's interesting here is that she realized that, you know, she got a sense of purpose from her work. Uh, it was something she enjoyed doing. Jean Norton, it also gives some indication of the, I suppose, the interrelationships in their, in their uh, particular circle. Jean Norton was the mistress of Beaverbrook, uh, who owned the Express, uh, and she was later to have an affair with Dickie. Uh, Edwina was herself to have an affair with Lord Beaverbrook. So it gives you some sense of, of how complicated their love lives were. Now, in 1924, they had their first child, Patricia, who died in 2017, and then in 1929, their second daughter, Pamela, who's still alive. And this should have brought the family together. But in fact, Edwina had no real model for being a mother, and she wasn't a particularly good mother. The girls tell stories of her walking up to the nursery. They wait for her expectantly to come in, and then she pauses and moves on to her room. And it was Dickie, really, who was the hands-on doting father though he'd always, and this, he made this very plain, had wanted to have a son. Uh, and quite quickly after the marriage, Edwina bored uh, and I think looking for attention and, and from men, uh, began a series of affairs. This was the first affair, a man called Hugh Molyneux, the future Earl of Sefton, uh, who had been a great friend for many years. Uh, she then moved on to this man called Laddie Sanford, who was a a polo player. He played for Yale, in fact, played for Cambridge. He was at Magdalen. Uh, and the rather poignant thing about this picture is at this point, Dickie doesn't realize that she's having an affair with Laddie. Uh, she, in fact, had, a, uh, had an abortion with his child. Uh, and uh, there were to be a whole series of other boyfriends throughout the, the 1920s and 30s. Here's a man called Mike Wardle, who worked on the Express. Uh, here's a man called Shukanau, who's a New York millionaire. This actually led to a divorce case or divorce petition, which Beaverbrook had to cover up. 
Uh, she then moved on to a woman called Sophie Tucker, who was a, a well-known singer at the time. The man in the picture here is, is called Peter Murphy. He'd been at Magdalen. He became probably uh, Mountbatten's greatest friend. He was always on his staff, uh, really right through from the 1920s. Uh, and he was a sounding board. He would often put a contrary point of view, and also he was a great sort of facilitator between the two of them when they were arguing. Uh, he was an unusual person to have. He actually was a communist. He was investigated by MI5, and he was uh, quite openly um, homosexual. The next lover was a man called Brian Sweeney, who was a golf blue at Oxford. Then she moved on to a man called Tony Simpson, who was a, a colleague of uh, Dickies in Malta. And this, again, was a high court petition. And this was all very embarrassing for Dickie, really for his naval career and also for his connections with the royal family. Uh, and it's uh, really about this point that they decide that uh, they will uh, divorce. And in fact, the marriage is saved. Edwina comes through to his bedroom. They always had separate bedrooms. Uh, and they talked uh, ostensibly to return a book. And they talked late through the night. Uh, and they agreed that they would have an open marriage, but that she would be much more discreet. Here she is with an actor called Larry Gray. Uh, and here is another uh, of her lovers, uh, Paul Robeson. This actually became a big case in 1932. Uh, and she was forced to sue for libel. Uh, against uh, the People uh, magazine, uh, even though actually the, the relationship was true. Uh, but as a result of that, the, the Queen Mary was uh, determined that she should sort of keep a low profile. And from this point onwards, she is really very rarely in Britain and very rarely with her children. She goes traveling with her lovers, particularly in places like South America, where she rides across the Andes, camps across the Middle East. She goes by a small boat across Southeast Asia even travels across uh, China and across uh, Russia. She's an extraordinary, intrepid, adventurous woman way ahead of her time. The other long-term relationship at this time was with this man called Leslie Hutch Hutchinson, another singer, uh, with whom she had a relationship for over 20 years. Uh, and indeed, Mountbatten uh, paid for um, uh, Hutch's funeral. Uh, Edwina herself uh, uh, was bisexual, and here she is with her sister-in-law, Nada Milford Haven, who'd married Dickie's brother, George. Um, Nada was involved in a famous case with Gloria Vanderbilt, where she was caught kissing Gloria Vanderbilt or Gloria Vanderbilt's mother. And um, uh, that was, again, part of the scandal surrounding her. Uh, Dickie decided that he, too, would have a lover, and this is his long-term girlfriend called Yola Letellier the wife of a very rich French newspaper proprietor uh, uh, called Henri Letellier. She's supposedly the inspiration for Gigi. She was Colette's uh, niece. Uh, and uh, Dickie would often go and see her in Paris. Edwina, uh, Dickie was never very jealous of Edwina's lovers, uh, but she was frightfully jealous of his. Uh, and um, she would often try and sabotage his attempts to meet up with Yola when he was on leave from the Navy. What I should say is I'm very happy to answer questions uh, at the end of the talk, so do do feel free to, to send them in. This is another of uh, Edwina's lovers, a man called uh, Count Antony Sapari uh, in Hungary. Uh, there's a story about this, and, and when she went to see him, she actually left her children uh, at a hotel. This was in July, and it was only when the governess got in touch with her in November and said, what should we do? We're running out of money. It's getting a bit cold, and we only have our summer clothes that Edwina realized that she'd left the children there and had to go and pick them up. Even then, she'd forgotten actually where she'd left them. And this is probably the most important relationship of the pre-war period, a man called Bunny Phillips, uh, who was a guards officer, I think probably in intelligence, uh, a great friend of Dickie's. He was later to be on Dickie's staff in Southeast Asia, uh, and who indeed married, at uh, having been introduced by Edwina, uh, one of her best friends, a woman called Gina Buena. Indeed, so upset was Edwina when the two of them got married at the end of the war that her, her family were concerned that she would actually commit suicide. And it was with Bunny that she did many of her travels. Here she is in Africa with Zabi the lion cub that she brought back. And here is Zabi back at Ad's Head. There was a huge menagerie of, of animals uh, at Ad's Head. Indeed, in many ways, Edwina was much better with animals than she was with children. This was because of her rather isolated uh, childhood and indeed she was rather better later on in her humanitarian career with other people's children than she was with her own. 
This is a picture of her on the Great China Road, the first woman to drive its length. Uh, and uh, while she was away, partly for tax reasons, partly to keep out a scandal, partly because she was looking for, in a sense, something to do to occupy her time. Uh, the home in Park Lane uh, was redecorated or basically rebuilt and redesigned by Lutchens. Uh, they, uh, you, they have Van Dykes here opposite the staircase. They're the top two floors of this penthouse. Uh, and it was an extraordinary place where they could entertain 80 for lunch. They, had, uh, they could show films to over 200. They had terraces looking out over Hyde Park that would take about 200. And looking at their visitors book, they entertained very extensively uh, and uh, with the most extraordinary range uh, of people. They also inherited just before the war her father, who was a Conservative MP's uh, family home, Broadlands in Hampshire, he was descended from Palmerston. Uh, and so they began to spend their time between, between the two homes. They continued to stay in close touch with the royal family. Here they are with uh, the Prince of Wales in Cannes in 1935 with Wallace, long before the story, of course, had broken publicly. They are actually on the famous trip in, well, on the Nile in, in, in the autumn of 1936. And Dickie's first wartime role is to bring the uh, Duke of Windsor, as he now is, back in, in September 1939 from France, where he's been serving with the military, French military mission. Uh, and Dickie at the war is a captain. He has been given command of a, a destroyer flotilla, the K flotilla. Uh, with uh, his own ship, HMS Kelly, and he is the first and only captain of HMS Kelly, with whom he's uh, indelibly associated. We always think of Dickey as a great naval commander. He liked to think of himself as the uh, um, most senior naval officer since, since Nelson, or the youngest admiral since Nelson. In fact, he was a disastrous seaman. Uh, his ships would uh, end up going over mines. He was very good at obeying uh, his orders. Uh, he would be torpedoed. He was instructed to go and pick up uh, some uh, people at, at the Battle of Norway, and he ignores the order. As a result, the men are captured and spend four years in captivity in Germany. So he, in most circumstances, uh, someone like that would have been court-martialed. But uh, Dickie is someone who is, in a sense, gets away with things that others wouldn't. And this is one of those episodes where he's torpedoed, 28 of his crew are killed, but he turns this disaster into a triumph. He brings the boat back to Newcastle. It becomes a, a great story in the papers. Of course, this is 1942 when the, there have uh, really been a series of defeats uh, and the papers are looking for a hero. Here is someone with good looks, royal connections, uh, clearly a very able uh, officer, and he was always headed for the top. He was always top of his exams. Uh, and um, the Admiralty want to court-martial him uh, instead, Dickey, uh, through Edwina, lobbies George VI uh, and is awarded uh, a DSO. But he comes to the notice of Churchill, and Churchill's always felt rather guilty about Dickey because in 19, during the First World War, uh, Churchill, as uh, First Lord of the Admiralty, has accepted the resignation of Dickey's father as First Sea Lord during a period of anti-German feeling. This is an episode that really drives Mountbatten's career throughout his life. Uh, there are accounts of boys seeing him uh, as a young teenager standing by the flagpole at Dartmouth with tears streaming down his face, vowing that he will avenge this family dishonour and himself become First Sea Lord. And he does that exactly 40 years later, taking his father's office, sitting underneath his father's portrait. And Churchill, as I say, feels very guilty about this. He decides that uh, that... Uh, Dicky clearly can't go back to sea or, or there will be no more ships left, but he is someone who can inspire people. He has great powers of leadership. He uh, gets on very well with Americans. He thinks outside the box and he uh, gets him in, in 1940 uh, to, to replace uh, Roger Keyes, the rather aging head of Combined Operations. Combined Operations role is to basically harry the enemy in Europe by mounting various attacks, which the most famous is Dieppe, which of course is one of the great uh, controversies of his career. But it also involves things like the um, cockle shell heroes and various pinch raids to steal uh, Enigma machines. Uh, and uh, as a result of his career in um, 
uh, in combined uh, operations. He is then promoted to other jobs. This is a picture taken at the filming of In Which We Serve, which again further enhances his reputation. This is based on the exploits of Kelly, which is bombed at the Battle of Crete. It finally goes down with Mountbatten, one of the last people on board. Uh, and his great friend, Noel Coward, decides to turn this into a naval propaganda film. Uh, and here the king and the queen and Princess Elizabeth uh, watch the filming. It's, it's absolutely pretty much word for word what happened if you watch it. But this again, of course, enhanced uh, Mountbatten's reputation. Uh, the war also was the making of Edwina, uh, and she uh, joins us in John Ambulance, quickly rises within, within its ranks. And by 1943 here, when she's receiving the CVE, she uh, has been, um, is risen right to the top. And in some ways, this is the making of the marriage. He's able to look at her as, a, as an equal. Uh, she now feels that uh, you know, they have a solid foundation, a public partnership. Uh, he, she learns a lot from him in terms of organization, working hard, using contacts. Uh, and uh, really from this stage, she finds a sense of purpose and validation. And uh, the her whole life ch turns around. So having been this rather, having had this rather wasted period uh, in her 20s and 30s, uh, during the war, she suddenly um, blossoms. Uh, and in the course of my research, uh, I found really no one who had a harsh word to say for her after uh, 1940. This is, they were actually sent off on propaganda tours. Here they are in the States, often for fundraising for war charities or to help uh, bring America into the war. Uh, and as I say, as a result of his success at combined operations, Churchill appoints him as Supreme Allied Command to Southeast Asia. The job in Europe has gone to an American, Eisenhower. Uh, the job in Asia would go to a British, British person. Uh, no one really wants the job. It's seen as a poison chalice. Uh, and Dickey is, it takes on the job, as he often did throughout life, jobs that no one else wanted, uh, and uh, becomes a, a, an admiral, a general, a, a air marshal in the Air Force. Uh, and the job is pretty much political. He's sent out there to work with the Americans, who regard this as their sphere of influence. Uh, he has to work also with Chiang Kai Chek, known at the time as Cash My Chek, who rather plays off the Americans and the British. Uh, and uh, he has to turn around the military defeats that have been in Burma. The Japanese, of course, have invaded, and, and, and um, it's all been rather depressing. And Dick, Dickie goes out there, and he does what he calls the three M's. He raises morale. Uh, he deals with the problem of malaria, which has prevented troops from, from fighting. Uh, and uh, he decides to fight through the monsoon. And the tide has turned, and giving support to generals like uh, Bill Slim, uh, eventually victories uh, begin to take place. Uh, one of his problems is he's starved of resources. It's seen as very much a sideshow. Uh, he wants to mount various operations, airborne, um, uh, seaborne operations. His experience in, in combined operations is very helpful here. But operations like Operation Zipper to invade Malaya are cancelled uh, as everything has been concentrated on the operations in D-Day. And in fact, when D-Day comes, he gets much of the credit for the planning. Here he is with Montgomery way back in combined operations when he was planning it. He is very good at bringing in scientists who will uh, do things differently, or rather more imaginative. Uh, and so many of the, the things we use at D-Day, like the pipeline under the ocean, the Mulberry Harbors, are actually very much on Dickey's watch. Now, when Dickey is in Southeast Asia, he falls in love with this woman called Janie Lindsay. Uh, Lindsay has an extraordinary, is an extraordinary woman. She's already turned down two proposals of marriage, one from uh, John F. Kennedy and, and the other from David Niven. Uh, but the two of them fall in love. She's actually on his staff. Mountbatten was well known for having pretty women on his staff. Uh, she's the granddaughter of the Duke of Abercorn. And she um, uh, really becomes his lover for the next um, three, three years. Uh, she also becomes a lover, showing how complicated it is, of uh, Bunny Phillips, uh, the uh, husband uh, of the great friend of Edwina Gina Werner and the previous lover of Edwina uh, Mountbatten. Meanwhile, uh, Edwina is having her own affairs. This is Bill Playley, the future head of CBS, uh, who was working for Shafe in London. Uh, and so she doesn't really change her spots. Uh, and, but they do work together very well. And at the end of the war, uh, in some ways, it's their finest hour. Uh, 
uh, there's a whole process of reconstruction and rehabilitation. There's the liberation of the prison of war camps. And Edwina comes out to join Dickey here. Uh, here he is addressing the troops, here she is too. They are very inspirational figures uh, and extremely brave ones. Uh, here she is about to go out to one of the Japanese prisoner war camps that hasn't even I think, been liberated to uh, bring supplies. Uh, and I think it's this period at uh, the end of the war where Dickey takes a very pragmatic view of the nationalist movements that have sprung up and often sided with the enemy that they should not be in prison but that they should work with them, that they should move towards uh, some sort of, of uh, uh, recognizing their nationalist aspirations. And so when uh, Wavell decides to replace, sorry, when, when Attlee decides to replace Wavell in 1947, uh, Dickey is an obvious choice. He looks the part, poor old Rab Butler wasn't, was, wasn't given it because he was too short and fat. Uh, he has his connections with the royal family, which would appeal to the princes. Uh, and there's a sense that uh, he is good at getting people to work together. He had a system called the Hive, where he would very deliberately get only three or four people around a table uh, and get them to hammer out their differences. I suppose what we would call mediation now. So they go out in March 1947. Now the plan is that uh, independence will come in August 1948, in sorry, June 1948. But Dickey uh, and Ismay and other people on the staff realize very quickly that if they don't move, much sooner than that, there will be no injury to give away. The Indian civil service is exhausted. There'll be no new appointments for the last five years. The army are very keen to be debobbed. Uh, uh, the Indian politicians are getting impatient. There's a huge rise in communal violence. And Dickey takes the controversial decision to uh, bring independence forward to August 1947. He also is forced into accepting that there will not be a federal India, there will not even be united India, but that there will have to be two separate Indias, uh, uh, a Hindu one under uh, Nehru of the Congress Party uh, and Jinnah of the Muslim League for um, the uh, Hindus. Uh, and that, of course, is a very controversial decision because this again fans the flames of the secular divisions. A good example of their bravery is this episode in Peshawar, beginning just after they arrive, when various Patan tribesmen are lobbying uh, the governor's house. It's looking very dangerous. Uh, and Dickey goes up, followed by Edwina, hold, you can see holding his hand, to talk them down. Any moment, worried that they might actually be shot and killed. Uh, his first task is to uh, bring the Indian politicians on side. He does that very easily with Nehru, who, of course, had been at uh, Trinity, who's a very sophisticated figure and where there's an instant attraction between Nero and Edwina, a relationship which has fascinated people ever since. And I think Dickey takes advantage of this uh, relationship that they have, this connection they have, uh, as indeed does Nero. He has a much more difficult task with Jenner, a much more um, uh, difficult character. Uh, you can see Jenner looking extremely um, uh, ill here, very thin. In fact, he was to die very shortly afterwards, after independence. And Dickey was to say later that if he'd realized how ill Jenner was, he might have taken, made different decisions. Uh, and the other person to keep on side was Gandhi, but that was no problem. You can see here after the first meeting, Gandhi putting his hand on Edwina's shoulder, showing, signifying his support for her. Uh, Edwina was going through a very difficult part of the time in her life. She was going through the menopause. Uh, she was extremely, um, uh, mercurial and difficult with, with Dickey, and this was to be an added pressure on him. It was also an extremely hot summer. So I think when we look at some of the events of, of, of uh, independence that summer of 1947, we have to take into account the, the personal aspects as well as some of the, the, the more public things that were going on. Here she is with Peter Murphy uh, at the uh, Viceroy's um, house. And here she is with her current lover, uh, Malcolm Sargent, composer and um, conductor with Biddy Monkton, who was married to Sir Walter Monkton, who was out staying with them. And here she is with Nehru uh, walking. Uh, the relationship with Nehru is, uh, no one quite knows when it began, but uh, my own view is that it was close really from, from very much from March 1947. It became physical, and I think it probably became physical even before independence in uh, August 1947. And one of the um, uh, things that uh, I think is, is, is very interesting 
there is is the way that uh, there's been a sense that you know these things uh, were not known about. Anyway, he rushes through independence. He uh, uh, there is of course great violence in August 1947, uh, and um, uh, one of the, I think the shameful things about the British uh, leaving India is they decide this should be an Indian problem, uh, and that India should uh, in a sense be responsible for the boundary changes. Uh, uh, or what happens afterwards. Uh, and though the British troops there who can take care of it, they are not brought in to, um, to police the violence. Uh, and here, uh, here they are, this is actually after the war, uh, Edwina would go out and see Nero every um, uh, six months or every year she would go out and he would come and see her uh, in the autumn. Uh, and it became a very important relationship. That correspondence is still closed, uh, unfortunately, uh, and um, uh, I'm struggling now to see if I can get access to it. The relationship with the royal family continued uh, in 1947. Here is the uh, uh, the stag party of Prince Philip, uh, and um, uh, Dicky was very much behind the the, the the courtship of Philip and Elizabeth. He uh, was actually working very closely with George VI. From uh, 1939, he actually brought the two together. And there's a lot of correspondence in the Royal Archives about that. Uh, and um, he actually came back from India to be here at the Stag, Stag Night. Uh, he uh, was, and Philip, who was his nephew, stayed with him in London. He was behind his naturalization. Uh, and indeed, uh, Philip took his name Mountbatten. Uh, he was determined that Mountbatten should, he should create this house of Mountbatten. Uh, and uh, he did briefly for a moment uh, just after 1952. Um, uh, and uh, after the war, Dickey uh, goes to Malta uh, as he returns uh, very quickly, having been the first governor general of India. He goes out to continue his naval career. Uh, the Queen actually comes and joins him. Uh, here he is with Prince Charles and Princess Anne. Uh, and. Um, they uh, became very close with, with the Queen and Prince Philip. They actually gave up their house for them. Uh, and this is the beginning of a very close relationship with Prince Charles. Uh, and uh, so there they are. And there was a lot of shooting that went on. Uh, and um, this is actually the last picture taken of Rubina. She continues her, her humanitarian career uh, on these world trips for Save the Children and, and St. John Ambulance. This was taken in February 1960. She's on one of these tours. Uh, she really has been pushing herself extremely hard, uh, and she um, uh, sadly, uh, uh, one morning her secretary goes to wake her up uh, and finds that she's died in the course of the night. Uh, she's been reading letters to Nero, and the letters surround her, her bed. Uh, she decides, for some strange reasons, she wants to be buried at sea, and this is the, the, the ceremony. Nero is actually allowed to send a wreath, which he throws in. Um, uh, after the, um, the the ship that is taken to tip her into the ocean. Uh, Dickey continues his naval career, so he eventually becomes first sea lord and eventually chief of the defense staff, retiring in 1965 after a career of, of over 40 years in the Navy. And this is Yura Letelier, a picture of her uh, at Broadlands. Uh, she becomes uh, one of his hostesses there. Um, he becomes very friendly with a woman called Sibylla Tomaschelli, who's still alive, I interviewed. Uh, and also with um, Sasha Abercorn, who died a few years ago, his goddaughter, who was much younger than him, uh, and indeed the woman that everyone thought he might actually marry. He also had a relationship with Shirley MacLaine, which surprises people. He, he loved going to Hollywood. He loved the showbiz world. Uh, and uh, here he is with um, uh, various stars. He was very attracted to Grace, Princess Grace of Monaco always inviting her to stay at Broadlands, but she always brought Prince Rainier to his disgust. Uh, and I love this picture. It shows a much more light-hearted side of Mountbatten than we're used to. Uh, um, uh, here he is, uh, I think, on the Royal Yacht. Uh, he became very clear. He had a lot of grandchildren. He was a very good grandfather, in some ways better than he had been as, even as a parent. Here he is with his son-in-law, David Hicks, the interior designer. Uh, and here they are at Classyborn, their home on the west coast of Ireland. Uh, and here he is with one of his grand grandchildren. And you can see a very fun spirit. We think of him as this rather imperious figure, but actually he was extremely um, easygoing. He could be extremely charming. Uh, he could be extremely difficult and vain as well. In many ways, he was known as a, 
very good officer for, for the men in the ship, but actually a very difficult man to work for as a naval officer. Um, so every year they used to go to Classybourne for August, uh, and in 1979 he was specifically warned that he should not go. There had been a series of threats specifically against him. Uh, uh, of course, we'd seen Erin Neve killed earlier in the year. And this man I interviewed, who I hadn't spoken before, called Graham Yule, who's a military policeman, was sent, um, was sent given the task of a security audit to uh, make sure that um, everything was in place. And he reported back that the sighting of IRA, members of the IRA at Mullock Moor, he also more ominously said that uh, the Mountbatten boat, which had always previously been guarded and indeed had had a, a, an attempt to put a bomb on it the previous year, had been left unguarded. And he reported this to uh, his superiors. Now, instead of anything being done, he was actually taken off his duty, sent to Hong Kong, uh, and um, uh, we saw the results of that with tragic consequences. Uh, on the last bank holiday of August, 1979, uh, a six-man IRA team uh, watching from the cliffs uh, detonated a remote control bomb uh, and blew up um, Shadow, the, the little boat that he used to go out fishing. He was lifting some lobster pots uh, and um, uh, Mount Batten was killed instantly together with a grandson uh, and also um, a, a young boy, a friend of, of, of one of the grandsons uh, and Mount Batten's son-in-law's mother, uh, Doreen uh, Rayburn. Uh, and these are some of the pictures um, after that event, which I think a lot of people will, will remember. There was a huge uh, funeral the next month, uh, almost on the scale of Churchill's. Uh, Mount Batten had been planning it for years, uh, and um, uh, an address was given in Westminster Abbey by Prince Charles, uh, and this is the, the man who was convicted, the only man to go to prison from the six-person team, uh, Patrick McMahon, who served 16 years until he was um, let out under the Good Friday Agreement. This man called Joe McGurl, actually, they didn't find enough evidence against him. It was based on forensic evidence, uh, and he was let go. But he died in a mysterious tractor accident a few years later when the SES were on manoeuvres. Uh, and this is the episode which, uh, in some ways, I think distinguishes my book and my research from everything that had previously gone on before. Because in the FBI files, uh, I found that from 1944, various people had come forward and uh, told various stories about uh, Lord Mountbatten. This is a woman called Lady Desize, who was uh, a gossip columnist and, and, a, and moved in royal circles. Uh, and she goes, to, she's actually been interviewed by the FBI about something else, but she tells them, and I'll read out what's said there for those who can't, um, that she's been an intimate to the British Queen Elizabeth, Queen Mary and her ladies-in-waiting. She states that in those circles, uh, Lord Louis Mountbatten and his wife are consider considered persons of extremely low morals. She stated that Lord Louis Mountbatten was known to be a homosexual with a perversion for young boys. Now, this clearly hadn't been in the script in anyone else's other, other books. Uh, Philip Siegler had actually specifically said in his official life he'd found no evidence that uh, Mountbatten was homosexual. And I devote a chapter in the book called Rumours to the stories about Mountbatten. Uh, there are actually uh, FBI files going through the 50s with other people, including the wife of the Secretary of State for India and a senior intelligence officer, saying some of the same things. Uh, I then uh, began to interview people. The father of one of my great friends at uh, Cambridge, it was one of his ADCs, and tells stories of rent boys being sent up to his headquarters um, in NATO. Uh, I interviewed his chauffeur from Malta in 1948, who had stories of being told to go to the male brothel in Malta. Uh, I actually interviewed a man still alive who was his lover for the last seven years of his life, a young man then in his 20s. I also interviewed two boys who were then in the August of 1977, uh, age 17, uh, who were trafficked to Classyborn and described their experiences of being abused by Matt Batten. Now these are very controversial claims to make. Um, I interviewed the boys at some length. I'm sure that, the, that, the, that is, they're telling the truth. They never actually sought, to, I found them, they never expected any payment. They actually have court cases going on and their stories have been corroborated elsewhere by other people that I've talked to, both in the intelligence services uh, and other people who were abused. Uh, I, one of the boys came from a boys home in Belfast called King Cora and I talked to 
uh, in fact, got uh, the government to release some of the Concora files to me in 1917, which they were due to do. And then for some strange reasons, they reclassified the files and they're now been closed for another 50 years. My attempts to get the uh, logbooks uh, for, from the Garda for cars going into Classyborn in August 1977 have been review, refused on the grounds that this, they are part of the murder inquiry two years later. Uh, and uh, the supply of FBI documents began to dry up. And when I asked what had happened, I was told they'd been destroyed. When I asked they, when they had been destroyed, I was told only a few months previously after my request to see them. So there's clearly something very odd going here. And I think one of the explanations may lie with this man. He's called Frederick Lawrence Long. Uh, he was uh, the man who actually married Edwina and Dickey in 1922, and um, the private tutor of Dickey in the summer of 1914, uh, when Dickey was ill and missed some some work, uh, school school work, uh, and uh, recuperated in Bridport with Lawrence Long, uh, who eventually ended his career unmarried as a vicar in Ipswich. And one of the things I found in the uh, archives, and the archives at Southampton and Mountbatten's papers are extensive. There are many thousands of, of papers. Mountbatten's kept literally everything right from the, from the start. But amazingly, there's hardly anything from Lawrence Long, except for this letter I found in 2016. To Dickie, as you know, there's only one Dick in the world for me, and there never will be anyone before or anywhere near him in my affections. It is hardly necessary for me to add that I would give anything to wipe the floor with you. God bless you for the time of happiness we have had together. And that's an extraordinary letter to write to a young boy. And I leave you to draw your own conclusions from it. Uh, uh, my research into Lawrence Long has, 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 has really led me nowhere. All the papers seem to have been destroyed. He had no close relations. But I think uh, what I find so extraordinary is that clearly Dickey had this secret life. He had a very dangerous double life because, of course, homosexuality was legal until the 1960s. In fact, it was forbidden in the armed forces till the beginning of the century. So he was risking a lot. And a lot of people knew about these relationships. I was able to talk to seen former uh, members of his staff uh, about this, people like Dwayne Bramwell, who worked for him, uh, Pat McClellan, who's still alive, his military assistant. And these stories about his bisexuality were known. He was known within the Household Cavalry for insisting on interviewing all the young officers and actually even making passes and some of them. So it is extraordinary that these stories, which circulated only really in private eye, never really came out uh, uh, until now. And one of my ambitions in writing this book was to write what I called a warts and all biography some uh, 40 years after his death, which is what I've done. I think in reassessing him, he and, and Edwina were both great people. They were extremely dedicated public servants and extremely able. Uh, and I was fascinated by their, their marriage, which was unconventional. She was supposed to have had something like 18 lovers, uh, but actually on their own terms worked uh, extremely well. Uh, and I think it humanizes the two uh, and gives a completely different side. I think we're all interested in what happens in people's marriages. Uh, and theirs was a particularly interesting one to study. Now, I see I've got seven questions. I'm very happy to answer them. Uh, uh, so do keep sending them in. Uh, the paperback of the book has just come out, and I would say that I'm continuing to add to the book and hope that when I have access to the diaries and letters, which are still closed, that I'll be able to revise the book uh, and add new materials. So um, I'm always interested when I talk to people to hear of other people's experiences. When I give talks or gave talks before lockdown, I would often come across people who had kn known them or whose families had known them and had stories about them. So I'm just looking at... Um, the questions. The first is, what subject will your next book be on? Well, the next book is on the uh, life of the Duke and Duchess of Windsor after uh, abdication in 1936. It looks at his period and his Nazi as governor of the Bahamas, his, uh, whether he had Nazi sympathies or was played by the Germans. It looks at the feud with the royal family uh, and I think draws some parallels with the experience of Harry and Meghan now. Um, and then someone else says here, thank you. I wondered if you'd formed an opinion uh, what career Edwina, sorry, it's jumped. Um, I'm just going back up. Sorry about this, reading things. Uh, oh, can I show the Mountbatten family tree if possible? I'm afraid I can't. There is a family tree at the beginning of Ziegler's book. And I think if you Google it, you'll find a family tree. 
Uh, Edwina and Dickey's serial affairs were typical of the upper classes of their times. Have more have mores changed significantly today in those circles? Well, uh, I don't know. I don't move in those circles, but I suspect that they they haven't really. Um, there are clearly lots of stories still about members of the royal family, and they seem to live in very similar ways. Some of them. Um, the council the supposed 1968 uh, coup. Sorry, I'm just having to read them out. Uh, concerning the accounts of the supposed 1968 Harold Wilson coup, all we've got is the anodyne Hugh Cudlip, Solly Zuckerman accounts to various hints given in your book. Is there anything likely to come out from the archives to show that there was more to this than the MI5? Um, sorry, I should just sit in this. Um, uh, talk of loose talk of gin sodden generals. Well, I look very carefully to try and find information uh, in Cudlip and Solly Zuckerman and, and uh, also Cecil King's papers. What's fascinating is the papers have clearly been weeded. Uh, there are huge gaps uh, and um, uh, whether they have been destroyed or whether they will be restored, uh, who knows. Uh, uh, but uh, Mountbatten certainly was much more involved in uh, the coup than he let on. He actually put forward various candidates, including the head of uh, Hammer Horror Films, a man called Jimmy Carreras. Uh, and uh, it's only really if someone comes forward with some York has discovered whether I think we'll learn. Mountbatten's uh, um, correspondence with them it doesn't exist for that period in 1968, indeed a bit later. So at the moment, uh, you know, I've done the best I could, but there are clearly gaps. Um, um, now, I'm just looking here. Uh, amazing that the aristocracy could get away with serial adultery in the 1920s and 30s, whereas other classes would have been condemned as immoral. Uh, presumably the press of the day was far more deferential. Uh, indeed it was. Sorry, I'm going back up. It keeps dropping down. Um, far more deferential. What about the church? Was this an example of establishment hypocrisy at its best, worst? Well, I think the thing is, within their circles, they were known. Uh, to be uh, uh, having affairs. They were pretty discreet uh, 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 and people just didn't talk in their circles as I think they don't talk now. Uh, and um, so I think they got away with it. Um, and even now, I, people that I know know a lot more than they're saying uh, will not say anything more and they won't talk to me or won't talk to me about that. Um, now, the origins of my interest in Mount Batons actually came from the biography I wrote of Guy Burgess, who had been at and Locus Park Mountbatten's prep school. I read Ziegler's book and I felt it was a very, you know, good book in many respects, but very official. And there was no sense of Edwina, uh, even in Janet Morgan's book, which had the cooperation, and no sense of actually this marriage. And I think looking at them through the prism of the marriage, I think gave a different aspect. And I felt that 40 years on, there was more I could say that people perhaps couldn't have said uh, when those books were written in the late 1980s and early 1990s. Um, uh, and very nice to have various people, uh, contemporaries of mine, uh, writing in to say how nice to see me. I see Graham Walker there. Um, and someone's saying, what do you, career do you think Edwina might have had? Has she been allowed to have one? Well, who knows? I think she would certainly have been uh, the head of some large organization, whether it's charitable or elsewhere, uh, of some other kind. Uh, she was a great networker. Uh, and... Um, I think, you know, uh, as more of an equal and clearly with time and money and this high intelligence and this great sense of public service, uh, uh, she she would have currently been a very well-known figure. And I think people are beginning to recognize her contribution. I think there's still a very good book to be done on Edwina when those uh, letters and diaries are released. Um, uh, someone said, do you find at the end of your research that you actually like Dickie and Edwina uh, who came through the letters and photos, etc. more. Do you admire what they made of their lives? Yes, I do admire them. Uh, you know, I admire they could easily have been frivolous in the way that Wiener you know, was uh, in the um, interwar period, but they worked very hard. They took on difficult jobs because they felt they should. They were extremely brave and risked their lives. Uh, and, um, you know, they were remarkable people. And I think what comes across in the book is his vulnerability and insecurity, which we don't normally associate with him, uh, um, particularly in the early days of the marriage. Someone said, uh, do, do I think that Mountbatten should take the blame for this problem with partition? Well, I think he takes part of the blame, but, you know, he had a large staff. He was working closely in conjunction with the Indian politicians. And I think they all take responsibility for their irresponsibility. And I think also this idea that they wanted independence to go 
with a swing. They didn't want it to be overshadowed by anything. Uh, and that we would go out, you know, proudly. Uh, and I think it was very cynical, the, the way they oper all of them operated. Um, and this idea that, you know, the British wouldn't be there to save Indian lives and they wouldn't risk British lives. Um, so, uh, you know, it's a big debate. There's a, a book by Barney uh, White Spooner, um, which deals with this published recently, is clearly a lot of academic research. I cover the subject of his time in India in several chapters, and it is very difficult. It's very complex, and, and uh, uh, you know, one has to take a rather balanced view. I think they deeply regretted the violence after August 1947 uh, and did their best. And this is, in fact, how Edwi uh, Edwina and Nero got particularly close. They worked very closely um, to, uh, with the, their humanitarian work to, to, to deal with things. Um, did I like them more? Yes, I did like them more, I think, at the end. I mean, you might say I was critical because I exposed many of the flaws, but, you know, that's what makes people what they are. Um, someone's asked about my research in Burma. Um, I do have a little bit about his time in Burma, but, you know, in a life which is so filled with incident uh, uh, and which is meant to be a popular book, uh, I couldn't go into too much detail about Burma. There, there are other books that deal with Matt Batten in Burma. Um, that, that I'd recommend, and I think you can see in the bibliography. Um, someone says, thank you for helping some victims to be heard and access justice. And that is one of the things I had no interest in paedophilia uh, as a writer before. It's not something I expected to find, but uh, I do feel that the, the, the stories need to be told. Uh, and indeed, one of the victims who appears in the book uh, from Kinkora, I talked to him on the phone this afternoon, he rang me, he lives in the States. Uh, his court case about getting recognition um, he has been really basically ignored for years. Uh, his story is beginning to uh, come out now uh, and he's had to deal with a lot of very difficult issues. Um, indeed, the other boy that was abused with him uh, does not want to go public with the story and that is because uh, his family would be shocked, he says, to discover you know, what happened to him. Um, someone has a story of Labour canvasser calling in 45, said to Mountbatten, uh, asking if he was a Tory, the only need, people you need to worry about, sorry, asking if he was Labour, the only people you need to worry about are the servants. Uh, uh, and that is absolutely true. Uh, there was great concern about Dickie and Edwina. She was seen to be, in some ways, a communist. Uh, uh, um, and uh, there were lots and lots of stories, hence the investigation of Peter Murphy. Uh, but he was certainly a very, I would say, a very liberal and pragmatic figure rather than a dogmatic sort of Labour supporter. Um, Someone says, my interest relates to being given sports day prizes at Northcliffe School by Lord Mountbatten about 1965. That school was next to Broadlands in, Ram in Romsey. Uh, the Mountbatten's were very popular locally in Broadlands. Um, they uh, knew everyone very well. A lot of people locally clearly worked for them. One of the joys of this book was to meet members of staff, including a man called John Blanton, who was his footman in the 1950s, uh, and Bill Evans, his valet in the 1960s. Uh, and... Um, uh, something like kind of 30 people I interviewed uh, uh, who knew Mountbatten, either on his staff or worked for him. Someone says, Edwina changed very dramatically. What do you think motivated her personally, not just the circumstances of war? I think uh, it was the opportunities that she was given uh, during the war, the sense of having to do something, maybe a sense of growing up, uh, uh, a sense of purpose that she'd lacked before. Um, and I think she enjoyed the work. Uh, and... Um, uh, became, and in, in some ways it drove her to her early death. Uh, someone said, do you believe the marriage was from the outset essentially a marriage of convenience? No, I think it was a love match. Uh, I think it was uh, uh, a physical relationship, but I think they were very different people um, and I think they felt constrained by perhaps the, the, the roots of marriage. I think they discovered the secret of a happy marriage, which I'll pass on for those of you who'd like it, and that is they didn't see very much of each other, and so they kept the whole thing far more exciting. Um, someone's asked what happened to Klausi Born after Mountbatten's death. Well, it had close connections. He'd actually sold it before he died, uh, uh, and uh, but had the use of it every August. Uh, the person he sold it to, the widow, still lives there now. Uh, and I think members of the family still use it. Someone says, what's the importance of looking into the personal lives of Dickie and Matt Batten? Well, I think it, it brings them alive. It makes them, you know, rounded people. And I think this is a good example of where the personal and the public intertwined, because clearly her relationship with Nero shaped the perceptions of uh, the Muslims towards independence and how far he was in the pocket of Nero. 
uh, apart from you know us all having a role of prurient interest in other people's lives. So um, I think you know biographers now want to move uh, to tell the full story, and that is as far as you can tell the story of their private lives and their marriage, as well as the more public life. Um, who of anyone? Gosh, I'm sorry, the, the questions keep coming in. Um, now. Uh, I'm just going down. What if anyone are relatives of the Mountbatten's alive today? Well, uh, the daughter of Pamela is still alive. I talked to her. I talked to two of her children, India and Ashley. There are, I think, seven um, grandchildren who are still alive um, from Patricia. Uh, and then there are clearly other relations uh, from Edwina's uh, sister and indeed from uh, the family of Mountbatten. So there are lots of people around. I mean, it is extraordinary. Um, Pamela Mountbatten is often interviewed. She's now in her um, 90s uh, and very articulate and very open, and they were very helpful. And I, I'd like to put on record, you know, the fact that they were very understanding. This is not the picture perhaps they would have liked to have presented. It's not the one I expected. Uh, and they never sought to interfere in the book. They were extremely helpful. Um, now, someone was saying, how long should records be closed? Well, we have now a 20-year rule. Uh, we also um, have a rule uh, under digital protection, that um, a 100-year rule, that things um, that would reveal information about people are deemed to be closed until 100 years after their birth. So a lot of stuff is closed. Uh, and of course, anything to do with the royal family is closed, anything to do with national security. There are lots and lots of exemptions. So in some ways, it's rather frustrating for the story because there's a lot of stuff one would clearly like to have look, a look at, but one can't um, because uh, documents are closed. Um, uh, here's someone saying, I, try, I produced a BBC documentary on the abdication of the Duke of Windsor and tried to get Mountbatten to take part, but it was told very clearly that would only happen if Mountbatten had script approval. The BBC refused. I also tried to get him to take part in a documentary on partition, got the same answer. Was he a man who was obsessed with his image and his place in history? Yes, absolutely, he was. And part of the book is about his shaping of his legacy, the curation, the way he worked with only particular authors, like the authors of Freedom at Midnight, uh, and um, uh, dissed people who, who wouldn't, um, in a sense, support his line. So, yeah, he had his, his sense of history very much in place. And it's fascinating to see how the archives were controlled. People were required to return letters to him or persuaded them. Um, question here about their sexual health. Well, there are stories. Someone came up to me who, uh, at one of these talks who said that uh, Edwina had a, a sexually transmitted disease, and that was actually one of the reasons by her early death. Someone said, what was the relationship with Prince Philip in the 1930s? Well, the relationship was much more with Mountbatten's mother, um, Victoria, and also with the brother George. And it was only when George died quite young that Mountbatten became much more of a sort of a guardian figure. Uh, what is the story behind the security man being sent to Hong Kong after the Wuhan IRA attack? Well, that's all in the book, in, in, the, in the chapter on Ireland. Uh, do we know that Edwina kept diaries? Yes, she kept a diary throughout her life. These are the diaries that I'm attempting to look at. Um, someone says they were champagne socialists that put me off the coup. That puts me off the coup story. Would the army want to replace one crypto communist with another? Well, I think the thing is, it, he was flattered by the attention. I don't think it would have got anywhere. He was extremely loyal to the Queen, but I think he he did feel there was a uh, there was room for a national government. The national government would have included people like Alec Douglas Hume and Jenkins. So there were two in effect coups: the one in '68 and the one with the disaffected generals and MI5 people much later in the '70s. Um, Someone's saying here there are only 13,000 soldiers in India at independence, so Mountbatten could, couldn't really do anything to go against what was actually happening on the ground. Yeah, but again, if you read Barney White Spunner, you know, they had uh, RAF squadrons, they had Indian Army units they could have used that were loyal, um, uh, Gurkhas and people like that. So um, there, are, there were things that could have been done. They, they didn't need to wash their hands of it in the way they did. Um, did I find the evidence that he designed the signal officer's tie, blue blood and grey matter, which he's wearing in the photo of the couple in plain clothes? Uh, Ziegler refers to it and quotes the name of an officer who told him, uh, I've been in the archives researching his work and there's no mention of it. Uh, and one would have thought so if he had. I didn't find any evidence. But Dickey did certainly um, uh, lie. He actually got Churchill to change the account of Dieppe in his own memoirs, which wasn't true. 
So um, uh, Dickey certainly rewrote history. Um, what I would say is I think we're running out of time, but if you Google my name, you can uh, find my email. I'm very happy if you want to email me or ring me uh, and to carry on and answer questions. Did Edwina experience any mental health issues? Not that I'm aware of, though she was clearly quite a highly strung woman. Uh, she certainly went to a doctor who specialized in sex addiction, so she had a very addictive personality. Uh, I don't think there's any question of impropriety with his relationship with Philip or Charles or anyone else, Not, nothing that I've found. Um, and um, I think we may have run to the end of our questions, but I hope so. Um, how much influence did he have on Prince Charles? Well, extensive. Uh, this was the son he never had. Charles called him his honorary grandfather, uh, and uh, they saw a lot of each other. Charles had a room at Broadlands that he could use, uh, and Charles saw, his, saw himself, sorry, Mountbatten saw himself as the kingmaker, um, and um, saw a lot of Charles. It was him who was part of the group who suggested he should go into the Navy and go to, to Trinity. So um, uh, there is, you know, I think he's a very important influence. And in fact, Charles gave the, the um, address at the funeral, I think says, says it all. Um, I think we've reached 4.32 uh, and I think probably I've reached the end of my time period, but I'm very happy as I say to speak to other people if they want to get in touch with me subsequently. Uh, and um, thank you very much for, for listening and, and your wonderful questions.